Welcome to the Changemakers Podcast, brought to you by City Current and powered by Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance. This show shares personal stories and insight from those who are giving back and making a difference so we can learn and do the same. We cover life lessons, business advice, passion, and purpose. Now here's our host, Jeremy Park. Welcome to the Changemakers Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. We are in for a local treat. We've been on a kind of a national run for a little while with some of the storylines with Changemakers, um, but we're back local with the Memphian and doing amazing things through an organization called Porter Leith. And we'll talk all about Porter Leith, amazing history, legacy here in the Mid-South, doing amazing work. And we have Rob Hughes. He is the Vice President of Development for Porter Leith. How are you doing, Rob? Good. Thanks for having me. Good to see you all. Absolutely. So let's start. The fun of Changemakers is that uh, we'll talk obviously about your work with Porter Leith, but um, we get to kind of dive into your personal life and how you got involved in philanthropy and city building, community engagement, the whole nine yards. So let's start with where did you grow up, Rob? So I'm, I'm from Memphis. Um, I accidentally got into nonprofit like most folks. Uh, was dead set on law school and then uh, all of a sudden overnight was not no i don't think i'm dead set on law school anymore you mean the lsat and all the uh, I, I did all that got accepted and <laughs> it was like hey i'm going off law school and then one morning it's like eh, i don't think this is such a fun idea to me no offense to our attorney friends um but no knew all along even with a law degree with or without really wanted to get involved in community development um uh, making the world better um, locally in memphis better um and really be able to do that a whole lot more quickly um through the nonprofit lens Talk about your parents, though, and just, you know, siblings. Was community engagement, was community service ever a part of just, you know, your growing up in your childhood? Um, it was. Um, you know, in high school, I went to Christian Brothers, and they had just started the service hour component there um, right when I got there. So that really wasn't necessarily a forced um, volunteer effort, but at the same time, really got me in parts of the city that last volunteer opportunities um, was right down the street from Porter Lee's historic campus on Manassas. Um, and, you know, three blocks over there sat Porter Lee. We didn't go that way, so I didn't see it. But, you know, 10, 15 years later, there I am at, at Porter, actually not even that long, 10 years later, there I am at Porter Lee. So what does it mean to you to grow up here, have your family here, to be working here, knowing that you're focused on making a difference here? Because I think that's kind of a cool piece of this. It really is. Um, and, you know, that kind of went to the whole law school thing. Is I thought I needed to get a law degree and go to D.C. to make local change. And that's probably one of the worst paths anybody can take in hindsight. Um, I haven't done that. But, you know, being able to stay local and really uh, – keep my ear to the city throughout the process and really see firsthand and hear firsthand what's going on, what some of the challenges are. Uh, it's, it's been really eye-opening to me because I thought, again, you had to go somewhere else to make a difference locally and you don't. Well, it's funny because I just came from a meeting and one of the things was you always hear this, this saying, think globally, act locally. And it's like, no, you can actually think locally and act locally and that's how you create global change. Exactly. So to your standpoint of just really getting involved and rolling up your sleeves, um, you know, but also having the pride of saying, hey, this is where I've grown up. I'm a Memphian and this is where my family is and I want to see our community improve. And so I'm going to step in and, and make a difference. And obviously you have the path of law school, but to say, no, I want to divert and actually roll up my sleeves and kind of go this route with my life to be able to see that impact firsthand to get involved is, is special. Uh, absolutely. Um, and again, you know, the work that Porter Elite does, I'm sure we'll talk about in a second too, but um, it's, it's really been probably one of the best vehicles to do that. Um, and, you know, I didn't know that growing up by any stretch of the imagination. So to be able to do that now is, is really awesome. Give me, just from your standpoint of growing up, uh, play any sports, give me maybe a fun family tradition. Give us a little bit of your childhood. So sports, I tried really hard, uh, is, is the best answer. Uh, <laughs> pretty much your average mediocre athlete, um, pretty slow, pretty uncoordinated. Um, always, you know, like, oh, if you're three inches taller or, you know, a couple pounds heavier, you could be a great athlete or you, you do well. And just never got there. Uh, but I tried hard. Uh, but no, school was um, fun for me. It really enjoyed enjoyed it, but uh, really got actively in, in the service uh, through scouting. So I'm an Eagle Scout. I'm very proud of that. Um, and that nice. really um, had a lot of fun doing that. So much fun that uh, almost turned 18 without submitting my Eagle application. It was all done. It was just a matter of turning the application in. So what did you do for your Eagle project? So I went out to Ames Plantation, out um, way out by Grand Junction, and helped them. This is right when the whole GPS thing was coming online, and did some markers for them um, of historic places around their 
property. And I actually was telling somebody the story earlier today. Uh, funny how that works. That I discovered then that 11 and 12 year olds are probably not the best source of volunteer labor when you're digging with a post hole digger. Um, <laughs> it it took you know an hour or so um, to watch 11 and 12 year olds. Dig a hole. It was a slow, slow process. Hey, well, that's you know, team it got building done. and it learning got done. and leadership, and that's that's where you learn, right? It, it got done. Uh, I think at that point, that was one of those management lessons of how to hide frustration uh, the best you possibly could. That was, that was one of those good days for that. <laughs> So, okay, so being an Eagle Scout, give me on your end, um, there's so many lessons learned between the camping, taking a leadership role. Um, I'm thinking trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind. Was it thrifty, obedient? Uh, I mean, there, there's close. Yeah, I must say, I know I'm close, but um, what are some of the things that stand out to you as lessons that you learned in scouting that are really important to still carry with you today? Um, I think, you know, being a leader but still being involved in the process, don't try and lead from afar um, and don't just try and delegate everything and expect it to get done. I mean, you, you still have to be willing to get your hands involved um, and really make that effort yourself. Um, being an example of leadership by doing is, is a huge, huge lesson that um, – not to pick on millennials because I'm probably in that boat, depending on what birth year you go with, but um, not to knock on millennials, but I think that's one thing that um, may just not have seen a lot, but also to knock on some older folks too. I think they've forgotten that very early on and they should be reminded of that. So on your end, when you look at stepping into Porter Leaf, what led you to Porter Leaf? Give us a little bit of that story in terms of stepping in and kind of working your way through because recently you've been promoted to vice president. So there's a, obviously a nice personal storyline for you there, but tell us how you got to Port Elite. Sure. So um, again, it kind of talked a little bit earlier about falling into nonprofit uh, accidentally, had had no, uh, I guess, leanings toward raising money as a career um, going forward, but was it another nonprofit for a year um, right out of undergrad? And then about a year um, after being there, or less than a year being there, um, an opportunity came open at Porter Leith. I didn't really know much about the agency. I'd heard the name, being involved in nonprofit, and um, really started to get involved in trying to learn a little bit more. The more I discovered what we were doing in the early childhood front, I saw that we could really make a difference um, with those early childhood programs. Um, you know, in my own childhood, really experienced what those positive outcomes can be um, when you start working with a family from a very, very young age, both with the parents and with the child. Um, and then multiplying that citywide how quickly you really can make change you know change isn't going to happen overnight but it still can happen pretty quick sure so go ahead and tell listeners what Porter Leith does actually let's start with history because I think it's a neat history lesson when you talk about Porter Leith and uh, just the the growth of the city but the growth of the organization with that so give us a little bit of history lesson for Porter Leith sure so um, fun fact um, I'm a history major in undergrad so I love fun facts that it's not useless information it's just you won't use it much uh, Porter Leith is the oldest child serving agency in the state of Tennessee so we were founded in 1850s an orphanage uh, really for you know a handful of children um, in downtown Memphis, which in 1850s, a couple of city blocks by today's standards, um, and then moved out to Chelsea, Manassas. Um, we were an orphanage for 14 children, and then the El Fever epidemic and crisis really hit Memphis, and that that was kind of our huge moment of growth. So we went from you know being an orphanage for about a dozen children to over 100 children um, in the span of a very, very, very few years. Um, and answering that call for the city of taking care of children who were here and had nowhere else to go um, and, and over time that those needs have changed quite a bit uh, it may not be because of yellow fever but we still have children each and every day in the city who, who need some help um, so history wise it's, it's really fun to see again I'm a history major in undergrad so it's been really fun to watch um, and, and go through the agency to, to see our different points in history whether that's yellow fever or so embedded in the Memphis history or, or legends um, like D.T. Porter who owned the Porter building downtown um, really all the way you know into the 1940s and 50s and 60s um, we had a, a really fun picture at, at our main campus and you may have seen this one we had two of our orphans back in the i think it was in the 60s standing at a, a shelby united neighbors event which is kind of the precursor to united way they're standing next to the speaker this big actor had been brought to town to, to talk to memphians about giving back and how important shelby united neighbors were and the actor's name was ronald reagan so oh, wow. you know couple of years later the guy yeah. sitting in the white house um, wow. so you never know who you're going to get to interact with or where they are but just all those different pieces where portal has been embedded um, obviously in the local narrative but also nationally as well 
So tell us at this point, you, know, you guys cover a very, very, very broad spectrum. We've done a ton of volunteer days where you go into the Early Head Start programs and volunteer with the kids, and it's uh, it's an amazing experience to be able to read to them, play games, dress up, I mean, the whole nine yards. Um, but you do feeding programs. You now train other preschool teachers and early Head Start teachers. I mean, you cover a very wide spectrum, even all the way up to retirees who then go back into the classroom and work with the kids too. So share kind of a snapshot of the programs where we are today. Sure. So Port Elite programs today serve over 50,000 children in Shelby County. Um, and again, you know, in 1850, that's a handful of children. It's, it's a dozen. Um, now we're uh, five figures and growing. So what we're able to do with our early childhood programs, and we have six programs, but really is to stack those programs on top of each other to make sure that collectively they're making a great intervention. So our cornerstone program does infant mortality prevention. We work with 300 pregnant moms huge track record of success there. We do use a home visitation model. Our moms had a 96% healthy birth weight rate last year. Uh, countywide, it's about 10% less than that. So really making sure that babies and moms are, are healthy throughout the process to get started. But then going into our preschool program, which is probably our most intensive program that we have, we have 6,000 preschool students um, all in poverty, making sure they get a great early childhood education. We know that when that happens, almost every single time they're going to get to third grade, reading on grade level or better, um, and be able to make that transition of learning how to read to reading to learn. And we know when that happens, they're going to graduate high school I mean, almost every single time, regardless of any um, socioeconomic patterns in their life before. So if you want to get out of poverty, we all know that education is a pretty great way to do that. Um, but on top of the education piece, we want to make sure that we're supporting the families um, as well. So uh, we have a family service worker that works with all of our families to help them really achieve life goals. And then there's the social emotional development uh, that we're working on. We've been working on it for years, but we're really expanding that really around the whole concept of mindfulness, um, teaching young children to really be in charge of their emotions and have emotional intelligence early on in life so that they can control their reactions. Um, we've, we've got a, a few fun stories on that for later on. Um, but that's preschool. And then obviously the literacy piece is huge for us too. So um, we just merged, our Books Birth merged in to become right. our sixth program. So over 46,000 children in Shelby County get an age-appropriate book every single month in the mail. We're the largest affiliate of Dolly Parton's Imagination Library in the world. Um, we're very proud of that, as you can tell. Absolutely. Um, and that's for all children, making sure that they're – kindergarten ready when, uh, on the literacy front when they get to kindergarten because it's huge. If you cannot read when you get to school, you're going to have some pretty big problems. Um, and I know you know that pretty well, um, given your wife's work in, right, in the right. education well, world. Right, works in education, and she's been a, a big supporter of um, Books and Birth as well. And to your point, you know, it, it all focuses in on intervention, literacy, giving kid every opportunity and every family every opportunity to succeed and, and really doing it at an early age so that to your point, by the time they get to the third grade, they're, they've got the tools so that they can go all the way through and graduate high school and go on to a very successful life for them and their family. And when you talk about generational poverty, especially the power of education, if you can get them through to graduate high school, then go to college, you know, the statistics are all saying that the reality is it changes not only that family, but generations to come because education becomes the priority. So the power of giving them the tools at an early age to intervene, to give the families from the healthy birth all the way through, it's so critically important for city building. So in other words, the ripple effect for our community for what you're doing. Exactly. And I mean, and to your point about city building, that's exactly what it is and, and breaking generational poverty. Um, and one thing that we started last year is our teacher excellence program. So every year we're able to serve about 6,000 children in poverty um, under age five, which is is awesome. We've been able to grow that um, really from about 500 students um, about a decade ago. But the the, continu the continuing challenge there, though, is while we're serving 6,000 children, there's way more children that need to be served every year. Um, so, you know, I mean, almost half of the children in Shelby County under age five live in poverty. It's far more than 6,000 children when you start doing the math on that. So what we're able to do with our Teacher Excellence Program is to bring in providers from either daycares or other pre-K providers, charter school networks, mom-and-pop daycares, any of those. Their teachers can come in, sit alongside our teachers, go through the exact same training and best practice development with our staff, all at no charge to them, so that they can go back to their center and replicate that quality. Because when we do that, we know we're able to serve more children in poverty and get them kindergarten ready. And that's 
really expanding outside of the and quarterly And while they're vacuum. training, you're sending somebody else in their place. So in other words, they're not having to close their doors. You're sending somebody from your team to make sure that they're taking care of their business while they're learning with you. Exactly. We're taking a, a little bit of a for-profit knowledge on that, knowing that a lot of these providers are, are small businesses. They cannot shut their doors for a day to co- or a week to come get training because they're going to lose revenue, and that's what they depend on. So we have qualified relief teachers that we'll send to their center, again, at no charge to them, to help operate their classrooms so that those um, providers can come in and get that great training and continued um, input from our staff. It's not just a week um, training session. There's some follow-up that happens throughout the school year, too. I think that's important to understand, too, from a listener standpoint, is it's one thing to take control and take care of your own organization. It's a whole nother to say, no, wait a second, we're going to invite in everyone else that's a stakeholder in our community, anybody else that's doing these daycares, and say, hey, we're going to share our best practice with you. We're going to cover for you while you're gone, have you come in and learn all this so that you can go back into your business and be better equipped to truly help our children. Exactly. And we have to do that from really, um, you know, I mean, being cost effective and quality effective too is, is use that infrastructure that's already there. So there's already providers out there um, that want to enhance what they're already doing. We're there to help them do that. We're not here to start from the ground up, say it has to be this way, the, the way that we do it. No, we just want to share what we've learned from that and so that it can be replicated. Give me something that you've learned through this process of, you know, because with, with each undertaking and even the merger with bringing Shelby County Books from Birth, you know, under your umbrella for Porter Leith. Um, so, so from books from birth to, you know, launching this program to train other educators and, and preschool teachers. Give us some of the things that you've learned in, in a part of this process of how do we collaborate? Because I think there's so many that listen to this podcast, even from other cities, that say, okay, wait a second. I want to learn how they're doing it. How are they collaborating? How are they building those connections? How are they making a difference? What are some of the things that you've learned in this process? Um, it's really simple. Listen, um, listen to other people. Um, so we've we've heard the pain points of some of these daycare providers and some of these um, preschool providers that um, they need our help. And, and as we were listening to them, we thought, you know, we can help with this. Um, at the same time, we need their help with a few other pieces. So making sure that quality is replicated in their centers. And uh, we want to have a follow up piece there. Um, there's a data piece that we're really focused on um, that we want to have some follow up there as well. And I think the other piece about the collaborative effort too um, is just to be patient and continue to innovate though too um, you always have to innovate you can't just keep doing what you're doing uh, family friend uh, always says if you keep doing what you're doing you'll keep making what you're making um, so if, if we keep doing what we're doing we'll have great Port Orleans preschoolers but we're not able to share that outside of you know kind of our four walls at our centers and we want to do that for the community because it needs to be done I think the books from birth merger and kind of act, you know, however you kind of spin that but you guys taking that in is a brilliant move but, and I think that's kind of the innovation side. But give me another idea of when you look at, to your point, you can't keep doing the same thing over and over again. Otherwise, you just keep getting the same results. What's an innovation that you think, you know, this is something that we've done that may have been small, but ultimately it's paid off in a big way? Um, I think shifting and being very proactive about kind of knowing where um, funding streams we're headed as far as a funder standpoint of what they want from a quality perspective. Being on, on the front end of that, um, you know, we've – seen some some friends not be on the front edge of of, uh, such changes and it's hurt them pretty bad Um, I think the cornerstone program that I mentioned with the home visitation piece a couple years ago um, there we knew there's gonna be some funding but it had to be an evidence-based program our our previous curriculum that we used had great results um, but it was evidence informed it was not evidence based Um, so we switched the curriculum Um, and again it's kind of going from the hey this method gets you a 92 percent that's that's pretty good but if you switch you could get to 96 those four points matter Um, so it's something you have to think about very tough and very very long time but it pays off talk about you know we're entering into a year where i know nonprofits are kind of trying to figure out the tax plan and implications i know they're looking at to your point finding other revenue streams and other opportunities i mean f- financial the funding for nonprofits is always something that nonprofits struggle with when you ask a nonprofit what give me three things you're struggling with it's always you know fundraising volunteer development and then usually like awareness or and it's it could be in any of those order but it's it's how do we raise awareness how do we raise money and how do we get volunteers um, how have you guys been able to manage the growth of the financial side? What, what are some of the things you're looking at on that piece? Um, being very mission oriented uh, when it comes to making some financial decisions. So uh, we've been presented some great opportunities, but they were a poor mission fit. So we didn't do it. 
Um, if, if we don't think we can be the best at it, it's probably better for somebody else, um, which is tough as a fundraiser sometimes having to say, this check might not be for me, even though you're offering it to me, it might not be the best use of dollars here. Uh, but be, trying to be very transparent about that. Um, and the other is really focus in on continuing to build quality, 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 so that when those opportunities for growth do come, the people with the checks are looking for a great partner and they know who that is at the beginning. They don't have to go look for them. Um, and we've been very fortunate to be in that boat um, through our quality programs and, and continued improved outcomes, especially on the kindergarten readiness side with preschool, um, you know, basically almost tripling preschool, I mean, uh, kindergarten readiness outcomes over the last four years. So by doing that, the outcomes are there. We're serving more children. It's a great partnership. Um, and paying dividends for our children, which again is the ultimate goal. Right. Absolutely. What, what advice would you give nonprofits when it comes to raising awareness? Because, I mean, obviously coming on shows like this helps a little bit to uh, raise some awareness for what you're doing. But, um, but you know, media plays obviously a very vital, important. You guys also do a ton of events and big, huge events that bring the community together. But it's a chance to share your story and tell your story and your impact. What, what are some ways that you think you know, these are some best practices on your end that have been successful when it comes to the awareness and the storytelling and getting the – the mission out there for Porter Leith? Um, you know, we've had a, a fun um, run of that the last month. So February at Porter Leith is Foster Love. So we're focusing in on our Connections program. Um, going back to our orphanage roots, um, we, we're one of the oldest providers of foster care in the state of Tennessee. Um, it, it doesn't really fit our early childhood profile some, like some of our other programs do, uh, but we need foster parents. And that's really allowed us to tell not necessarily a new story, but a story that we haven't told in a long time to a lot of folks. Um, we had somebody last week, um, you know, the, the truth hurts. So last week somebody said, I didn't know y'all still did foster care. I hadn't heard anything on that in ages. Um, so that's something that we've really tried to share. So I think as far as advice goes, don't be afraid to bring up some old stories. Um, you know, if they're a week old, that's probably too soon. But if, if you've told that story a few years ago, bring it back up because um, there's probably somebody that may have heard it that forgot um, or I guarantee you there's somebody that didn't hear that needs to. Talk about events. Events play a vital part of what you guys do. They do. Um, We're fortunate we have some very large events. Um, So upcoming for April 15th is our Raging Cajun Crawfish Festival this year. Um, We are the largest one-day crawfish festival outside the state of Louisiana. Um, If you could help us condense that to a few less words, we could probably get it on a (laughs) billboard somewhere. Um, But no, it's April 15th this year. Very easy day to remember. Um, It'll be our 26th year. It continues to grow. I think one of our secrets here is we're one of the last free admission festivals in town. You don't have to buy a ticket. Um, if you want our VIP tent, you do, but that's only about 300 people out of the 50,000 people that we'll have down there. Um, so that's kind of one secret is, is just to make sure that everybody has access to come in um, and don't be too greedy um, with trying to make it a fundraiser. I mean, it's obviously very financially successful for us, but it's an opportunity to share with 50,000 people what we do and the impact that we have on Memphis and Shelby County, whether it's in early childhood services um, or even foster care with our older children through our Connections program. How much of that is a conversation that you have to have with either board members? Because I think, you know, there's, to me, I, I fall on that side usually where it's, you know, make it free, find other ways by selling, you know, crawfish or whatever it is to ultimately make the money, but allow it to be a community connective, you know, a, a community connection point, allow the, the public to come in. But then obviously on other sides, it's no, we need to make that money, so let's charge a ticket fee. I think there's, you know, obviously two valid sides. It's just a matter of which one is right for the organization. But, you know, is that a conversation that is, is difficult at all? Or is it one of those where it's like, no, this is this is something that we believe in and we go this route? It's definitely something we believe in. That said, it's a it's an annual conversation that we have. Um, one of the, the, I guess, hidden blessings of Raging Cajuns, we're one of the few festivals that has an active railroad track running right through the middle of our festival ground. So um, that does eliminate the ability to defense it um, without getting too creative and too expensive. But now back on the program side, I mean, we want to make sure that anybody that needs access to our programs has it. There's no, you know, really fee for service or anything like that. And we want to make sure our fundraisers do that too. We want to make sure that everybody has access um, to a public event that it really reflects um, everybody. 
I just think these are important. You know, when you sit on the nonprofit side and you evaluate, okay, how are we going to do what we need to do? How do we get the word out? How do we raise money? You know, these are valid conversations that every nonprofit struggles with, and you do have to kind of list out, okay, what are, what's the main goal? What's the main objective? And you know, in this case, to use it as a galvanizing opportunity, but ultimately to still make some money, but to say, look, the awareness, the connective to our mission of being able to serve um, and not charge that fee, that's that's what matters the most. And so that's our true north. Exactly. Uh, I mean, I think the true north piece is, is very much spot on with that. Um, you know, with Rage and Cajun especially, with having that many people there in Memphis, I mean, it's just such a great awareness opportunity. Obviously, we do some smaller events that uh, you do have to buy a ticket or a table or sure. things like that for, sure. but uh, we want to make sure that we have fun at our events. Um, raising money is, is definitely the goal there, but once that really is, is checked and, and it's a productive event financially, um, the awareness piece comes back into play is our next priority. Kind of what you mentioned earlier as far as, you know, those three greatest needs for nonprofits, always fundraising, advocacy, and uh, volunteering. So it applies to events too. There you go. Um, talk about the growth on the financial side. This is something that you've been very successful with in your career that was a part of this uh, new title of vice president, but you know, you've been able to build up. So, so share from the budget of kind of maybe, you don't have to go into specifics, but just a range even of just where you were when it started and just the growth of the organization since you've been there. So, uh, and I'll preface this, I'm taking very, very little, if not zero credit for most of this. I uh, had, had some great folks to work with and for the last couple of years. Um, when I first got to Porter Leith in 2009, we had about an 11 or $12 million budget. Um, today, financially, um, we're at about $35 million. So it's grown tremendously. A lot of, and all of that's really through early childhood. And again, continuing to build those quality um, stack services in on the, on the budget side. Staff-wise, um, one of our, my family, favorite stories when I first got to Port of Leith, I generally knew everybody's name and, you know, a little bit about them, their, their spouse's name, their child's name. Um, we had about probably 200, 220 employees then. Now we have over 650 across 15 wow. sites. So uh, I'm getting better with names and trying to be really intentional about going into the different sites and things like that, just to, again, make sure that our presence is there uh, day in and day out. Because really, as fundraisers, um, we're out and about meeting with different people all the time. But it's, it's kind of a family environment that we talk about at Port Elite all the time. Is um, It's good to go into a center and really be with your family that, you know, you may not get to see every single day. Right. So what's... <sighs> What puts a smile on your face? And I don't want to say necessarily a problem, but what puts a smile on your face when you look at that growth, when you look at the impact, when you look at the results you're having, the statistics? I mean, when you when you look at everything that Port Leith is doing, what puts a smile on your face? There's a lot of them. Uh, you know, on the early childhood side, um, I think one of my favorite moments really is – tied in with our toy truck event every year because there's always two or three or four, or in some cases, 25 children, uh, depending, or 20 children, depending on the classroom, that we walk by. Um, we'll come back after Christmas and the winter break, and, and we have, again, four-year-olds, so they're usually pretty forthcoming with anything that they want to share, um, and it never fails. There's always a handful of children that will come forward and say, guess what I got for Christmas? And it's like, I you know, I have to kind of play like, oh, I don't know what in the world you got for Christmas. And they'll come back with, oh, I got a bike or I got, a, you know, a new toy. And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, it was from our toy truck event. I'm pretty sure I remember seeing that come off the truck when we were sorting through. And uh, there was one young girl, we won't share her name, um, in our early childhood academy last January or back in January. And she came up and um, I'm pretty sure she would be a great salesperson at four years old because she told me all about her bicycle, how fast it goes, that it's silver, that it has purple stars and that the brakes don't squeak when she stops and that it has white tires. I mean, she knew everything about this. We need to get her signed up for a, a sales gig somewhere. But uh, Seeing those moments are, are really exciting for me uh, just because, I mean, I have two small children at home, so I know how much that means to them. Uh, but then even the parents and, and growing old or one thing that we talked about at our staff retreat, some new programs that we're working on right now is when you look at early childhood, um, you know, those small moments, even if it's a stranger, really makes a difference in a child's life, life growing up and even down the road. So I'm sure you can think about, you know, when you're four or five years old, somebody that said something to you, whether it's positive or negative, that still sticks with you to this day. Um, so trying to be really mindful of that uh, whenever we interact with our children, um, because I know if I say something really positive, hey, it might stick with that child. 30 years from now. They all, they'll have no idea who I was or who I am. They'll just remember that, hey, somebody said something nice and uplifting to me today, and it, it stuck with them uh, going forward. That It touches on the simplicity of the volunteerism, especially where 
as I mentioned at the onset, we go in and we work with some of the early Head Start programs, and it, it could be as simple as 30 minutes or an hour, and you go in there, and you know, many times you might take that time for granted where it's like, oh, I'm, I'm you know, just reading to them or playing with them and you know, saying some kind words. But to your point, you never know what that ripple effect is. You never know that by you going in there and, and simply reading to them and smiling, and you know, and, and you walk away feeling so loved. I mean, the kids are all just amazing kids. They come up and hug you and love on you, and, and it's just you walk out of there feeling just joy. But at the same time, you, I think as, as an adult, you forget many times that just even as a stranger, what you say can have a big difference in just a child's life of, you know, hey, great job. Or, you know, that, that letter that you wrote was amazing. And thank you. And your smile and you're, you're a beautiful kid. I mean, something simple like that can have a profound impact on their life. Absolutely. And that goes to the volunteer side, too. Um, it, it, I've had a ton of stories I could share, but uh, picking on one particular um accounting group um, that came in you could tell they were really they basically signed up for a volunteer day they were they were there to be out of the office and um, volunteer and you could tell some of the staff probably weren't so excited coming in that you know working with small children truly really not their cup of tea so they go into the classroom and it's I call it the instant wallflower effect two guys picking on guys uh, walk in the classroom and just kind of stay in there and our teachers are so engaging you know this right um, so I walk down the hall and I was like I'll come back and check on you in about 20 minutes I come back in 20 minutes one of the guys is down in his coat and tie on the floor barking like a dog because the story that they just read involved a dog and was interacting with the job. I mean he was having a blast awesome. he didn't want to leave and he's probably one of the standouts as far as folks that I was honestly a little nervous about if they were going to come back um, and, and he's had a blast coming into our classrooms and he shared too he said you know this is definitely outside of my comfort zone but it's so much fun he said I know it means a lot to these children but I hope they know it means a lot to me yeah see and, and that's what it's about and I'll tell you beyond that it's it's bridging relationships it's it's obviously bridging you know someone going in there with a suit and tie and um, you know humbling themselves and, and you know barking like a dog sure. and getting down and just playing with the kids but the relationships that are built are, are part of what we need as not just a city, but as a nation and as a world of, of healing those relationships. The other thing is, too, is you know, just by your story of Toy Truck, you become the mouthpiece for these kids that in many cases um, might have been forgotten for the holidays, for Christmas. And by saying, you know, look at look at the impact that this bicycle has for this girl and how much joy it's brought her and for her family to see the huge smile on her face knowing that they probably couldn't afford it for themselves, but yet all of a sudden this miracle happens through the generosity of someone else. And now, you know, I get to see my child light up. Um, I think that's the other cool thing is you become that mouthpiece, that storyteller to then share with others why it's so important for them to be involved with Porter Leaf, yes, and also to just with our city as a whole. Sure, and I think that um, kind of goes back and ties in where we kind of started with this. Is I know we're all very guilty about living in our little bubbles. Um, some people live in a small bubble, and some people live in a big bubble citywide. But um, just really being intentional about trying to get out and um, you know be nice to everybody. Uh, it's a pretty basic principle, but um, you know getting outside of your comfort zone a little bit and realizing that. Um, just because somebody lives in a different part of town or um, is, is not as fortunate or any of that um, doesn't mean we shouldn't care about them, doesn't mean we shouldn't invest in them. Um, one of the principals, um, one of our, our former uh, or one of our, our um, staff members shared that, you know, we shouldn't necessarily, we're all in the same boat together. So if there's a hole, you're into the boat. I'm in trouble too. So let's make sure we plug the boat. Um, That's a good just because right. if I'm doing well and you're not, the boat's still going to sink. Right. Well, you um, can be up in the captain's ship all or up with the captain's thing saying, oh, it's not going to affect me. But either way, if the ship's going down, the ship's going down. Exactly. Right. And I, I think taking that mindset um, you know, locally or nationally, we're all in this together. Um, so just because somebody else that you may or may not like is not doing well, their failure is tied to your success as well. And it, it's unfortunately sometimes not an either or. I mean, it, it's going to take everybody to succeed. And this is one of those circumstances. I'm curious, you being a father, how has your work with Porter Leith maybe changed, enhanced? Uh, how how has it has it changed the way you look at being a father? Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and this might be another four or five hour segment if we keep talking about this. But um, you know, just I think one of the the fun stories there is uh, 
with our cornerstone program, we have a, a whole team of parent educators, and they work with families. And there's there's obviously some prenatal pieces there about having a healthy pregnancy, but a lot of it is just to, yes, you're going to be a parent, you're going to be okay. People do this all over the world every single day. You're going to be fine, even though you don't know what to expect going into it. And I find myself in that boat all the time. I'll talk to some of our teachers, like, hey, my, my three-year-old's coming back and saying this, like, is this normal what I do? Oh, yeah, that's fine. It's completely normal. So really having those friendships in place staff-wise uh, just to be able to learn more about that and kind of what to do and that, yes, it's very normal for three-year-olds to act crazy sometimes. <laughs> uh, it's part of it. Um, so, I mean, there's that calming factor there too. But then uh, just having worked with it so much on the early childhood development piece with knowing that, you know, I mean, my three-year-old's brain right now is over 75% developed. Um, so the last three years, it's um, it can be a little scary because you second-guess yourself of, did I do enough of this or did I do enough of that? Um, but she's just fine. She asks lots of questions. Uh, and what right are all where, the talk, touch, play? Exactly, all yes. of those. Um, and really just use everyday learning as, as an example. Um, and, you know, I think that's one really cool thing that I've learned going into our preschool centers you don't really see desk. Our children don't sit behind a desk and, and listen to a teacher teach from the chalkboard or anything like that. It's a very engaging experience using day-to-day occurrences to learn. Uh, if that's creative play by dressing up like a um, police officer or a firefighter or a doctor, perfect. I think what's really interesting is just the shift of how important the early education and the Head Start programs are. I mean, I, I even look at, you know, when, when our youngest was little, um, you know, it, growing up, it was, well, the, the mother was, you know, like our mom, you know, stay at home and, and help the kids. And, you know, even for my wife and I, and obviously she being a working parent as well, we thought, you know what, the programs now are so amazing that it actually gives them a huge advantage. And I think culturally, it's been a big shift over, the, you know, maybe a decade or longer, whatever it is. But I just think when you look at these programs, they're so robust. And I, I actually told her, I was like, I feel like he's so far ahead by going to these programs because he's you know learning interaction with other kids he's learning to your point it's highly interactive it's not just sitting there at a desk i mean the the programs themselves have become so innovative and so engaging and i think it's because we realize the importance obviously and how can we enhance this as a city but and, and as a nation um and i think it's 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 put us in a unique position to be able to leverage that it has, and um, I think that's one very strong advantage for Memphis. Um, I think the early childhood piece is really coming together in Memphis. Um, we've got a, a, a great foundation of stakeholders, and it's starting to replicate very quickly. People are understanding that early childhood is one of the best investments you can make, period. Um, in low-income families, in high-income families, um, in rural families or urban families, um, if you want a great city going forward, invest in early childhood education and programming. Um, because, I mean, the returns are are tremendous, um, not just the short-term gains of making sure their child's school ready and goes on to third grade ready or reading readiness and graduates high school. That's all very important. But even the lifelong pieces too. Um, there's there's some really well documented stats out there about children that go to quality pre-K are less likely to be involved in crime later on in life. They're more likely to own their own home. They're more likely to be employed. So I mean, it's all these factors that you may not see for 20, 30, 40 years that come back to that early childhood moment like I was talking about a minute ago. That's yeah. why it's so important because it's really making sure that foundation piece is there because if your foundation's solid, you can do anything you want to. You, you mentioned kind of the historian side but, and you got some good fun legacy in there, but uh, give us one other thing that you think everybody should know either about you or about Porter Leith. What's a, what's a history thing that we should know beyond the kind of the traditional Porter Leith history that you gave us before? Ah, uh, that's that's a fun. Well, what's one. a good pretty, trivia question that we tough. should all know or be able to throw out there? Did uh, you know? Did you know? Um, uh, I have to think about that one for just a second. Yeah, maybe we'll come back to that. Uh, yeah, one. let's come back time. to that. <laughs> so this is the, the benefit of being unscripted and the downside of being unscripted is <laughs> sometimes I think a good curveball. It's like hmm, I don't really know. So let, let's switch over to something we call lightning round just because it's, it's more fun. And this is – they're all short answers. Um, there's, like I said, nothing scripted with any of this, so right. for better or worse. But um, what's, a, what's a recent book you've read? Um, so I'm currently reading Hillbilly Elegy um, by J.D. Vance. And I think probably the most recent ones I've read um, – mentioned I'm a big history junkie. So there's um, The Liberation Trilogy by Rick Atkinson. Um, there's, it's a series of three books. It's collectively probably – 1,500 pages, so wow. you're in it for the long haul. Uh, but it really focuses on um, the U.S. military during World War II and really kind of um, not being so well organized by the time the Africa campaign kicked off and then going into Italy, being a little bit more formed. And then by Germany, everything had, had kind of come together. Um, 
pretty interesting leadership examples in there too. You get to see the good and bad side of just about everybody. And I think that's one kind of takeaway for me, um, whether it's leadership or management or any of that, you don't have to be perfect because nobody is in leadership. Um, I think recognizing mistakes and being able to correct them or recognizing your shortfalls is probably the biggest piece of that. Nice. What's a recent movie? Well, if you having kids or a TV show yeah. or anything, usually uh, it's like, you know, Paw Patrol. So, um, <laughs> fun story about that. Um, I had not seen Frozen up until about a month ago. Oh, wow. And then with the snow and the ice and my wife being sick, um, Frozen hit the DVR, and I'm pretty sure I could quote it from start to finish now. So um, you can start singing some Elsa songs. I, and... I won't, but I probably could. <laughs> um, you, you might lose some. We'll let Andrew lose them, sir. that song in <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let me hear. <laughs> what um, what's a favorite vacation spot for you and your family? Um, we since we've had kids, we've not actually taken a vacation really anywhere. But uh, my wife and I love going out west. So Denver, Bozeman, um, I mean Boulder. Yellowstone, any of that stuff, we just we love it. So hiking, camping, hiking, climbing. camping, any of that. Climbing okay. is great. Um, I'm a little accident prone, and my wife knows it, so no, no more climbing for me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we we just love being outside, um, and I think there's something great about mountains. And, you know, the low humidity is very nice for us. That said, we we're not out there snow skiing or any of that. We go in late fall. Uh, the last time we went to Yellowstone, it started snowing. It was eight degrees, so we had to find a warmer spot pretty quick because I don't handle snow very well. <laughs> what uh, what are some favorite restaurants here local? Um, locally, Fino's is one of my go-tos for lunch. Um, love it. I mean, between sandwiches and pasta, any of that stuff is, is great. Um, I went to CBU for undergrad and grad school, so there's a lot of good midtown spots. Blue Monkey for lunch. I know this is sounding crazy, but no, Blue Monkey for lunch is a good, good spot. You never know who you'll see in there. Um, you know, Bayou Bar and Grill, any of those midtown spots are great. Outside of the area, what are some favorite either restaurants or just things that you guys enjoy as a, as a we'll say a, a couple? Um, so neither one of us went to Ole Miss, but we're big Ole Miss fans. Um, so anytime we can get to Oxford and go to some of the restaurants down there, um, we thoroughly enjoy doing that. Nice. All right. So give us uh, what's next for Porter Leith, or at least on your agenda. What, what's a goal that you have coming up? Um, so we've got some new programming that I can't talk about right now. Uh, I'm really excited. And again, it's just another layer um, of stack services there to, to really focus in on quality um, in early childhood. That um, Some of those things I was talking about kind of replicating outside the Porter Leith bubble. Um, there, there's some more stuff coming on that that we're really excited about. And then the foster care piece um, is really exciting for us, too. So anybody that's considered being a foster parent, should really talk to us. Um, in late March, we have kind of our first session of our orientation part to get you ready to go to foster care. Um, we've got over 30 people signed up to attend that. So wow. the, the interest is there. There's a huge need for it um, in the city to really work with um, the children who are part of sibling groups because the state, we really try to make sure we don't split up sibling groups right. and try and keep families. The functional family pieces are there trying to make sure that those are continuing to, to work and, and be together. So it's one really great opportunity area for us. What sort of training, I mean, when you look at, okay, if I raise my hand, say we want to learn more about that, take the next step, sure. what is that next uh, step? So you live in Shelby County, so you, you met one. Um, I think you're over age 25. Uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay. Slightly. That's, there we go. So uh, <laughs> those are the two big ones. Um, but so from there, we have the um, Parents as Tender Healers PATH training. It's, uh, I think it's a five-session training session there or in, uh, our training program on how to be a foster parent so it covers the basics um, of you know this is normal don't don't freak out um, and then there's a, a quick home certification process there that takes two or three visits and you're ready to go nice all right so going back to just your personal uh, lightning round what's something you like to do to relax how do you relax? Do you relax? Um, is there such a thing as relaxation in Rob's life? With two children, yes, there there are. It's called after bedtime, uh, so I can I can watch TV shows that are not animated. Um, no, so I, I think that's one piece, um, and then just being outside is a really good relaxation point for me. Um, I'm a terrible golfer, but I love playing golf. I'm a absolutely horrible guitar player, um, but enjoy doing that. Again, with, with two small children when they're asleep, it gets a little tough. You, know, you can't turn the amps up or anything like that. But um, So wait, what kind of music do you like to play on your guitar? Uh, a little bit of everything, um, but again, I'm, I'm absolutely terrible. So I picked up my guitar for probably the first time in two or three years. Um, I was having trouble with basic chords last week, so 
Well, you talk it's, about turning the amp up, I'm thinking, wow, this guy's a it's, turn out and rock out. That's good. Uh, it's an opportunity for development. <laughs> um, really lot, loud country. Yeah, well, somewhat. I live in DeSoto County, but I listen to some non-country stuff, too. But no, uh, so last night, um, I think that's one thing, the thing that's really fun, too, with, with young kids is, is to let them, because they don't know that it's uncool or anything like right. that, and they're dancing around having a blast. Or, um, so last night, I found a cover. It was uh, ZZ Top playing the Ernie Ford 16 Tons. Interesting. Hadn't heard that before. It was an interesting arrangement, but it was loud and I enjoyed it. So, <laughs> highly suggest that one. <laughs> All right. So, going back, now that you've had a little bit of time to think about it, is there any sort of fun fact trivia question that we should know? It could be about you. It could be about Porter Leith. We'll let you deflect that however you wish. Or you could even make something up about Andrew when we would never know. Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think one of the, the trivia things to know um, about Porter Leith is um, – you know, we're, we're really focused, and I don't think this is too much of a shot, but we're really focused on that quality piece, not on quantity. We've grown over time, but, um, you know, we're really focused on doing what we say, and if we can't do that, we won't. Um, and that's kind of going back to one of your questions earlier, too, is, you know, sometimes you do have to say no. Uh, so that's one trivia question about me personally as a fundraiser. Sometimes, uh, un- thankfully, it doesn't happen a whole lot, but um, sometimes that funding's not a good fit for us. There you go. All right. So the last two questions are, are, you know, the fun ones to kind of end on on our end. But what, you know, looking at kind of your legacy, I mean, obviously you've, you've been an amazing part of the Port Elite storyline and the growth there. And as you said, I mean, it's a team, obviously, approach to all of this. But when you look back, you know, decade, two decades from now, what do you hope that your legacy has been, not only with Port Elite, but here in Memphis? Um, to really have made a great push on that early childhood front um, because I know when I first got to Port Elite, we were kind of coming off that cycle where the community just there were pieces behind it but nobody really understood what it meant and it was kind of a, does this work or does this not I think legacy piece for me is you know 20 30 years down the road is you know we really did make an impact with that early childhood thing that everybody was questioning that we were right um, and that we continued to grow it because I think that's one of the biggest things people understand that it works now but we've got to grow it and I think doing that it would be very exciting for me from a legacy standpoint nice so the next one was the logical follow-up to that is how do we get in touch with you so talk about social media website what are the easy ways for those that say hey I want to be a part of this. I want to learn more about Porter Leith. Where would so, you direct them? Um, everybody needs to be a part of this because, again, that early childhood piece is, is critical for our community going forward. But um, email is real easy to get a hold of me. It's rhughes at porterleith.org. It's all one word. It's on the website. Um, if you forget Porter Leith, just Google Porter Leith or how you think you spell it, and it'll show up. There's not too many of us in the world. Um, and then phone numbers, 901-577-2500, and just ask for Rob. I, I'm pretty sure I'm the only Rob still on staff. Uh, I'm that vain. But no, I uh, <laughs> It's extension 1167 if you need it. <laughs> well, Rob, uh, you're, you're a good friend. We see you out in the community always doing good, and uh, you are a change maker indeed. Greatly appreciate you coming on the show and uh, sharing your story, but also, to sharing the power of Porter Leith. So thanks for all you do for coming on. Appreciate it. Thanks for help, helping us share Porter Leith when all we do. Thank you for listening to the Changemakers podcast, produced by City Current and powered by Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance. To learn more about our guests and to share your stories of others leading by example, visit us online at citycurrent.com. Connect with us online using at citycurrent or follow the conversation using the hashtag changemakers. Now, think big, start small, and act now. Be a changemaker. 